This week on the A Push Show, we're looking at Chapter 14, The Civil War. We'll first look at the secession crisis. Hmm, the North and the South sure don't seem to get along. I wonder what will result from that. Oh yeah, I know, people fighting and killing each other. We'll look at the mobilization of the North. We'll look at the mobilization of the South. I wonder if they mobilized in Mobile, Alabama. They did. We'll also look at strategy and diplomacy. What did the North have to do to win? What did the South have to do to win? What does Taft have to do to get a meal around here? He just has to exist. And lastly, we'll look at the course of battle. What happened in the Civil War? Spoiler alert, the North won. But how? Was it easy or was it difficult? All this and more this week on the A Push Show. this chapter where we left off of last chapter with an escalating crisis of growing sectional violence that all levels of government proved powerless to stop. Anti-slavery voices in the North grew louder, and pro-slavery voices in the South grew more defensive and entrenched. Violence broke out in pockets all over the country, most notably in Kansas and Virginia, as the South grew increasingly hostile as their influence in government grew weaker and weaker. The perceived straw that broke the back of the camel that was the South was the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. Due to the layout of the electoral map, Southerners rightfully feared that they would never be able to elect a pro-slavery president ever again. Because of their lack of influence, certain Southern leaders would loudly and proudly advocate for Southern nationalism, which meant the Southern states would become a free and independent nation. These advocates for breaking with the Union would become known as fire eaters, and they received this nickname because they would swallow flames whole. Won't have Easy with the F word. We don't use that lightly around here, sir. They were called fire eaters because they were seen as extreme. But by the end of 1860, the fire eaters were no longer seen as extreme to most Southerners. They were seen more as prophetic. South Carolina, as you may recall if you've seen earlier episodes of the show, had a history of flirtation with secession, so naturally they were the first to secede from the Union. Secede is the term we use when parts of a country want to separate from a nation. I think we should use it more often. Use it the next time you have to break up with somebody. Taft, I'm going to secede from this union of man and cat. No, 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 I won't. Other states would follow the South Carolinian suit as Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas all seceded by February 1st, 1861, before Lincoln even took office. The seceding states would call themselves the Confederate States of America, or the CSA. Actually, they would never called themselves the CSA, but it'd be a whole lot cooler if they did. Acting President James Buchanan did nothing about this as he was weak. So, so very weak. Guy couldn't lead his way out of a wet paper bag, Taft. He did nothing as seceding southern states took over federal properties like forts, arsenals, government buildings, and such. South Carolina tried to take over an island just off of their own coast where a U.S. fort called Fort Sumter was located. President Buchanan sent a ship to reinforce the troops there, but southerners would fire the first shots against the north and force the ship to turn around. In response, Buchanan did nothing. Shocking. War by this point seemed inevitable, but calls were still made for compromise because at the end of the day, war is something to be avoided. Generally, people don't want to just stop doing everything and just start shooting each other, no matter how angry they are. Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky tried to issue a compromise that bore his name. This compromise, the Crittenden Compromise, would have made a better faith effort at maintaining the fugitive slave law and would extend the Missouri Compromise Line all the way to the Pacific. 
The few Southerners still in the Senate at this point liked it, but the Republicans all rejected it as they had a firm stance of no extension of slave territories no matter what. With the nation divided like never before or since, Abraham Lincoln would arrive in Washington, D.C. to take the office of president. He had to do so in disguise in the cover at night in order to avoid assassination. Of course, this would not be the last attempt on President Lincoln's life. Conditions off the coast of South Carolina at Fort Sumter continued to escalate. Neither the North or the South wanted to be the side who started the war. But in the South, it was far better to be called belligerent for starting a war than to be called a coward and not responding to an act of aggression. Lincoln sent a relief expedition of troops and munitions to the fort. To allow the expedition to land was seen as cowardly by the South, and they weren't going to allow for that. The Southern Confederacy would command General General P.T. Beauregard to take the fort by force if necessary. If you ever wanted to hear a name more southern sounding than General P.T. Beauregard, my stars, I don't think you're going to. Beauregard's army bombarded Fort Sumter for two days on April 12th through the 13th. On April 14th, the fort was taken and the Civil War had officially begun. Both the North and the South would mobilize for war. Four more states would join the Confederacy, a.k.a. the CSA, in Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Some on the North and South began to wonder if perhaps a breakup or secession was for the best for both sides of the country. Some, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, felt that the United States was made up of two wholly different civilizations, and the two were incompatible. Many in the South felt the same way. However, the prevailing anti-slavery and free soil arguments ruled the day in the North, but very narrowly. Many people in the North agreed that slavery was an abomination that must be stopped either for moral reasons or economic reasons. No, I'm not a betting man. Shut up, Taft. But if I were to look at the advantages between the North and the South, I would bet heavily on the North to win the Civil War very easily. In terms of its population, the Union, a.k.a. the North, was twice as big as the South and four times as big as the Southern non-enslaved population. The North was more industrialized and can produce all of its own war materials, whereas the South was virtually non-industrial and had to rely on foreign aid for military supplies. The North also had much better infrastructure to get people and things around via canals and railroads, whereas the South did not. The North also had a well-established government structure and economy which would allow money and ideas to function smoothly, whereas the South had to invent a government and an economy on the fly. The major edge the South did have was that they were fighting a defensive war on their own soil. This meant that all they had to do was last and not surrender. This also means that they would know the land and the northerners would not. This also means that it's way easier to motivate soldiers to fight if they are fighting to save their own homes from an invading army. It's way easier to convince someone to fight to save their own home than it is to convince someone to travel somewhere far away, kill people you don't know, to take lands you'll never own for the benefit of a government that will probably give you next to nothing in return for your service. In terms of size and materials, the North had every advantage. However, in terms of motivation, the South was miles ahead of the North. And a motivated and defensive army is nothing I would ever want to fight. Taft, would you ever want to fight a motivated and defensive army? Well, of course, you fight anything. You fight me most of the time. Yeah, Taft, you won that fight because I quit fighting, but you always fight dirty. You bite. You're such a dirty fighter. As the North was barreling towards war with the South, it was also engaged in massive economic projects. It's kind of wild to think that the North would engage in projects like selling Western territories, helping establish schools, building railroads, and establishing a banking system during a civil war, but they did just that. Because the obstructionist, now secessionist Southerners 
were out of the picture, the North was free to engage in many of these economic measures that they had been aching to do for decades. They would charter and begin to build a transcontinental railroad. They would pass the Homestead Act of 1862, which allowed citizens and prospective citizens to claim 160 acres of land and purchase said land after living on it for five years. They also passed the Marill Land Grand Act of the same year, 1862, which transferred public land to the states who were then to sell that land for the purposes of financing public education. From this act, many new state colleges and universities would emerge and are still known to this day as land-grant institutions. Colleges like the University of Wisconsin at Madison, Ohio State University, and the coolest university of them all, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the university I went to, and the university many people call the Harvard of Central Illinois. Maybe. Republicans would also pass the National Banking Acts, which established a new banking system. To join the system, banks had to have a certain amount of capital, which is basically the money banks have for loans and savings and other fancy banking boy things. And banks had to invest one-third of that capital in the government. In return, banks got to be part of that system and got to issue U.S. Treasury notes as currency, which is basically what we use today. This would provide more stability for the economy, but financing the war was tricky. Wars are super expensive because not only do people stop working to fight in the army, but soldiers generally expect to be paid and have to be provided food, clothes, weapon, and medical care. Lots and lots of medical care because I don't know if you guys have heard, but wars are kind of dangerous and bad for your health. To try and pay for all these things, the government levied taxes and would institute the first income tax the country had ever seen. Nowadays, we're expected to pay income taxes every year, and we also get the added adult benefit of complaining about taxes for the rest of our lives. The government also tried to issue currency, which came to be known as greenbacks. Greenbacks were based on faith in the government having good credit, which is what our currency is based on today. But people back in 1861 didn't have faith in this system of currency, as the fate of the nation seem understandably shaky in the early 1860s. Lastly, the book mentions that the North tried to finance the war from borrowing. And who did the North borrow from, Taft? That's absolutely correct. Good for you, smart beast. Government bonds or treasury bonds are when you basically give the government a bunch of money and they pay it back with interest. It's a loan. However, not a ton of regular people were willing to give much money to the northern government and most of the government bonds were bought by banks and wealthy individuals. Much like the South, the North had to raise a massive army from almost scratch. In 1861, the U.S. Army had about 16,000 troops, and most of them were in the West to defend settlers from the natives whose land they stole. To increase the army, Lincoln and the Congress encouraged the enlistment of volunteers to fight for three-year terms. This, along with a large degree of public support for the war, along with some healthy portions of propaganda from the government, helped to raise 500,000 troops, but still more would be needed by war's end. To do this, the U.S. government instituted its first draft, in which virtually all young adult males could be picked to serve in the military based on a somewhat random lottery system. What was pretty messed up about this draft was that if you could afford it, you could pay someone to take your place if you were called to war, or you could pay $300 to be excused from the war altogether. $300 back then was about $8,000 now. Because of this, a lot of wealthy families were able to avoid fighting in the war, but many volunteered to do so out of moral obligation. Regardless, this practice would lead to the common criticism by soldiers from the North and the South that the Civil War was a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. The draft made people angry, not because of its classicism, but also because it was a large degree of government intrusion into people's lives at a time when most people were used to the government not really affecting them at all. Okay, and we're back after some cat-related difficulties, but it appears they may have been solved with the help of a legal pad that Taft is currently sitting on. Taft is a very legal cat, which makes sense as his namesake was a former Supreme Court Justice. Taft, do you love the law? You can tell. You can tell he craves order, and he craves organization in his life. 
But anyway, back to the Civil War. Though only about 43,000 people would be drafted into the Union Army, in which over 2 million people served, when the first names of the draftees were read out in New York in July of 1863, massive riots ensued. Though violent opposition to the draft was rare, New York experienced one of the worst periods of urban violence the nation had ever seen, as many Irish immigrants who were already bitterly poor, raged against the government that now expected them to fight for a war they didn't much care to fight for in the first place. But the most unfortunate victims of the New York Irish rage and rioting was the African American community. The Irish saw African Americans as the reason for the start of the war, and already harbored intense resentment for African Americans as they were used to break a predominantly Irish longshoreman strike that was also happening at that time. Also, many Irish workers believed that if African Americans were freed, they would potentially replace Irish workers within the labor force. During the New York riots, the Irish attacked numerous properties, but would go after the homes and businesses of free blacks and even destroyed a black orphanage. Lynchings of African Americans would also occur, and the Union Army had to be called in to calm the violence. When all was said and done, over 100 people had died in the rioting. The politics of the Civil War was much more complicated than one might suspect. We nowadays see the Civil War in often very black and white terms, pun completely and unreservedly unintended. Americans today, especially those in the North, like to think that everyone would agree that the fight to end slavery was a good and just endeavor, that Lincoln was a brilliant and inspirational leader, and that surely no one could disagree on those points. Well, back then that was far from the case, as Lincoln's skills and leadership were heavily in doubt and Support for the war in the North was very flimsy. Lincoln took office as a political outsider. Most people agreed that he was a brilliant speaker, but worried as this perceived rail splitter and prairie lawyer with no national political experience would be overrun by more skillful politicians in the party. Lincoln would assemble a cabinet with leaders from every faction in the Republican Party, including men who personally felt they were more qualified to be president. Historians have turned this cabinet as a team of rivals, as Lincoln didn't want a cabinet of yes-men, but rather people who would challenge his ideas. Interestingly enough, these rivals would soon realize that Lincoln was indeed capable and that his authority within the group was final. But dissent within his cabinet is one thing. Dissent throughout the entire nation is another. Many people in the North did not support the war, and the Constitution has a way of protecting people's rights to voice their dissent. Lincoln chose to play pretty fast and loose with the Constitution to maintain the war effort. He managed to declare war on the South without congressional approval by calling it a domestic insurrection rather than a war. He also increased the size of the regular army without getting legislation legislative authority and blockaded the South. He would also throw many civilians in the North who dissented against the war in jail and suspended their right to habeas corpus, which is a Latin term which means to have the body. Basically, habeas corpus means you can't detain someone unless you have evidence that they committed a crime. So Lincoln threw people in jail just for the suspicion that they committed a crime. The Lincoln administration imprisoned over 13,000 suspected dissenters. When Supreme Court Justice and cover boy of the magazine Faces to Punch Weekly, Roger Taney, ordered Lincoln to release a dissenter from Maryland, Lincoln simply ignored the order. The 1864 election was therefore a tight one. The war was unpopular in the North, and many Republicans suffered for that as they would lose their positions in the 1862 midterm elections. The Republicans tried to rebrand and create a broad coalition called the Union Party, which also included a few pro-war Democrats. The actual Democrats would nominate former General George McClellan, who had earlier been relieved of his duties as the head of the Union Army because he was bad at it, and it appeared the North might lose the war under his command. He was the king of winning a battle against the South and then finding all sorts of excuses to delay pursuing a retreating Southern Army, thus allowing the South to regroup and continue to fight. Lincoln would win the election, but it was tight. Though he barely won the popular vote, he was able to squeak out a victory because of well-timed northern victories in Atlanta, Georgia, and a great deal of wartime propaganda in songs, pictures, and literature, as well as ensuring soldiers in the Union Army got to cast their votes. 
Which brings us to the issue of politics and emancipation. As I've mentioned on numerous occasions, the United States was and is a very racist nation. And we see that in the sharp divisions of the Republican Party on the issue of emancipation. Radicals wanted to emancipate enslaved Africans as quickly as possible, whereas conservatives within the party wanted a slower and seemingly more peaceful process of emancipation. Regardless of Lincoln's cautious view of emancipation, strength built quickly for emancipation with first the Congressional Passage of the Confiscation Acts. The first Confiscation Act started in 1861, and it essentially mandated that any enslaved people working to support the Confederacy would be freed. The second would be passed in 1862, and this emancipated any slave working for any person who supported the Confederacy. Congress also passed laws that would free slaves in Washington, D.C., and would allow African Americans to serve in the Union Army. The biggest blow against slavery, of course, would come with the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln announced his intention for emancipation on September 22, 1862, after the Battle of Antietam, which was the bloodiest of the whole war. The proclamation took effect on January 1, 1863, and it declared that all enslaved people living in seceded states to be free. It did not apply to enslaved people living in border slave states that did not secede, like Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. It also did not apply to slave states that were under Union control, like Southern Louisiana, Western Virginia, and Tennessee. It also didn't mean that Lincoln freed the slaves in the real sense. It's not like Southern slave owners heard the Emancipation Proclamation and said, Oh, shucks, guess I'll have to open the slave gate now and let the slaves run along. Instead, Lincoln's proclamation allowed the slaves the ability to more easily free themselves. Many enslaved African Americans would just simply get up and leave their plantations or leave the southern military camps where they were forced to work to support the war effort. Oftentimes, enslaved people would join the marching Union Army after it marched through the South. It's important to realize that though the Emancipation Proclamation put freedom to paper, it was on the enslaved people themselves to do the actual work of emancipation. Far too often, we love to say that Lincoln freed the slaves, and sure, he signed the paper, but it was the African Americans who would free themselves. The final step for full emancipation would come with the ratification of the 13th Amendment in 1865. This amendment outlawed slavery in all of the United States. After more than 200 years, the practice of slavery was legally abolished in the United States. And not only would blacks free themselves, they would also fight for the freedom of their people as they fought for the Union. Black soldiers fought in large numbers of the Union Army, composing well over 10% of the Army. What made the effort of African Americans soldiers especially noteworthy was what they were able to accomplish despite significant obstacles to joining the army. At first, African Americans were excluded from joining the army, which seems like a really stupid thing for the United States to do considering what black people were fighting for. But racism has almost never found a nose it didn't want to cut off despite its own face. Later on, as the desire for manpower grew, more blacks were allowed to join the army. For the most part, they were relegated to menial tasks like digging ditches or carrying water. All black regiments did occur, the most famous of which would be the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, led by Boston aristocrat Robert Gould Shaw, made famous in the Matthew Broderick movie, of course. It was not uncommon for black regiments to be led by white officers, as blacks were largely excluded from that rank. Blacks would also be paid a third of what their white counterparts were paid, and what should be a shock to almost no one were treated far worse than whites when taken as prisoner of war by the Confederates. After being taken prisoner, blacks would usually be returned to their masters if they were emancipated or escaped slaves, and were executed much more frequently than white prisoners of war. The mortality rate of black soldiers was much higher, as the working conditions they faced were often far worse and their treatment by the enemy far more hostile. Regardless, black soldiers came away from the Civil War with a great deal of pride for their accomplishments, and rightfully so. There's really only a handful of people throughout human history who have had the distinct accomplishment of fighting for the actual freedom of their people and win. It was not uncommon for leaders to emerge from the black community in the North and the South who were Civil War veterans. 
The Civil War, like most wars, caused a great deal of invention, but also inflicted a good deal of hardship for working class people. Some historians have made the false claim that the Civil War caused industrialism to flourish in the North, but this isn't really true, as industrialism was already flourishing well before the Civil War. There were many businesses that suffered from the Civil War as they would lose manpower as well as raw materials from the South. However, many businesses innovated tremendously as they needed to increase their reliance on machines because labor was scarce in certain parts of the country, especially the West. They would also increase the capacity of railroads as the standardization of rail tracks helped to allow more trains to reach more parts of the country than ever before. Interestingly enough, many workers faced a great deal of hardship. One would think that there would be more work to be done than labor could supply, but scores of immigrants were still arriving during the Civil War. Because of the continued flow of migrants coming into the country, wages only increased by 30% during the Civil War, whereas prices for things nationwide on average increased by 70% as war taxes and labor and supply uncertainties would drive up prices. Not to mention many workers would lose their jobs to automation, which is a way of saying that machines would take the jobs that humans used to do. As a result, many workers turned to union membership in order to take a stand for themselves, and the bitter struggle between unions and the owners of industrialist enterprise would continue to grow during the war, and of course would continue after the war. Just like in the Revolutionary War, women found themselves taking on greater responsibilities in societies as men were off fighting. Women would take on jobs that were vacated by men like sales clerks and teachers, as well as factory and office workers. As part of the efforts of the U.S. Sanitary Commission led by social reformer Dorothea Dix, women would also fill the vital wartime role of nurse. The U.S. Sanitary Commission was an effort to increase quality medical care during the war, as caring for soldiers was a massive undertaking. Nurses were sorely needed as twice as many soldiers died from infections and diseases like malaria, dysentery, and typhoid. Women would become so dominant in this role that the role of nurse would become identified as a role for women, and to a large degree still is to this day, for better or for worse. Though today there are many male nurses, and we salute their service towards the impossibly hard task of maintaining public health. Thank you, nurses, male and female. Taff, do you have anything to say to the nurses? Nice butt, by the way. Some men pushed back against this increased responsibility for women, arguing that it was beyond a woman's sphere and scope. Doctors would complain about women taking on roles in medicine, especially when nurses would push back against doctors who were incompetent. Regardless, because of the Civil War, women were able to take on much greater roles and responsibilities in American society. They would gain an important role in the medical field, and thanks to the efforts of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, they were better able to sanitize medical care for soldiers during the war and save countless lives. Rates of death by disease, though still very high, were far lower than they had been in previous wars. Enough about the North, let's talk about the South. Like most breakups, many Southerners were like, oh yes, new country, new me, y'all, and would boast about how different and better the new country was, but in a lot of ways, things were very similar to how things were before secession. The Confederate Constitution was almost identical to the U.S. Constitution, except that it recognized sovereignty to the states and made the abolition of slavery nearly impossible, even if an individual state wanted to do it. The first constitutional convention held in Montgomery, Alabama named Jefferson Davis as its first president, who was a moderate secessionist from Mississippi, and chose as its first vice president Alexander Stevens of Georgia, who was actually against secession. What the Confederacy did have in common with the Union is that both governments had a great degree of influence on leadership from the interior parts of the country rather than the elites from the Atlantic coastal regions. As for Davis's leadership, he was largely unsuccessful. He was never able to promote sound national leadership, as one of the main problems the Confederacy faced was a lack of unity. Many parts of the South were divided on the main issues of war. Of course, aware African American opposed secession and sided with the Union, but a significant amount of Southern whites also felt this way. The backcountry regions 
the hillbillies, as we derogatorily say, which had long resisted and resented the notion of Southern aristocracy, would not only oppose secession, but would sometimes undermine the South's efforts during the war. They not only would often refuse to fight for the Confederacy, but they would often aid the North and even fight for the Union in some circumstances. And just like the North, many whites disapproved of what the Confederate army and government did, especially when the outcome of the war seemed increasingly to go against their favor. Also like the North, the South had significant problems funding the war, except theirs were way worse. First of all, the South was a confederacy, which meant that there was no central government institutions to do things like have a national treasury to fund a war effort. Secondly, the South rarely issued taxes, and when they tried to raise taxes, Southerners could not really pay said taxes or they would refuse to. The confederate government would then try to get the states to take on the responsibility of raising and collecting taxes, which is just as disastrously unsuccessful. Third, since most people's money was in their land and slaves, they couldn't really pull money out very easily unless they sold that land or the slaves, and most people didn't want to do that. Lastly, there was no agreed-upon Confederate currency. There would be different currencies, depending on whichever state you were in, and sometimes there were multiple currencies within each state. The process of exchange and valuing these currencies was an absolute economic nightmare, which crippled the Southern War effort from the start. The instability also severely hampered the South's ability to conduct trade with Europe to finance the war. Not to mention that most of Europe was reluctant to side with the South as they already had business ties with the North and had little faith that the South would emerge victorious. Then there was the issue of manpower. The South would be outmanned as there were roughly 2 million Union troops who served in the war compared to the 900,000 rebel troops. The Confederate Army first relied upon volunteers for their army and were largely successful at first. As the war dragged on and victory became less and less likely, the South's ability to recruit an army grew more and more difficult. By 1862, recruitment was severely weakened, especially since the North had taken large territories which made recruiting soldiers from those areas nearly impossible. In an almost laughable move of desperation near the end of the war, in 1864, the South tried to draft 300,000 African-American slaves to fight for their own slavery. Before this comically terrible idea to come to whatever fruition it would come to, the war was already over. Want to know the definition of irony? A group of people fighting a war for states' rights, finding that they could not win a war for states' rights because they couldn't unify well enough because of their fierce cult-like devotion to, you guessed it, states' rights. States would refuse to pay taxes, would obstruct the draft, and would hoard supplies for their own states rather than give to the war effort. Really hard to win a war with no money, no guys, and no supplies, Taft. Thank you. Nice butt, by the way. Despite the obstacles, Davis's Confederacy did manage to take some steps towards centralization. The Confederacy would take people's slaves and force them to engage in projects for the South. The Southern government would seize railroads and harbors for shipping and impose limits on industry and cap profits. Basically, the South was doing a lot of things that had caused them to secede in the first place, except the whole emancipating African-American slaves. Yeah, they didn't do that, of course. The war would have disastrous effects on the southern economy. Remember that cotton was king in the south, but with no north to trade with and no foreign buyers because of a blockade, the south was in a world of hurt, economically speaking. The economy had to quickly pivot from producing pretty much just one thing to producing all the things for a 19th century society to not only thrive, but to beat a country to the north that was able to produce everything for itself and actually increased its abilities to do so during the war. Not to mention that most of the men working on the farms were off fighting in the war so that if a farm didn't have enough enslaved people working, that farm was destined to fail. And when they could, the enslaved people were running away in droves and many of those that couldn't run away fiercely resisted the authority of the women and boys left to manage them. 
But much like the North, many women took on additional roles within the Southern society vacated by men as women would manage the family properties, become teachers, take on jobs on the farm, and fulfill roles as nurses on the battlefield. But after the war, the effects on women was profound. Women heavily outnumbered men in the South, sometimes by as much as 36,000 thousand in Georgia because so many of the men died fighting. Naturally, women began to question the gender norms established by Southern aristocratic thinking, and the number of acceptable roles of women could expand. As for the actual fighting, both sides had very different aims. The North had to invade and destroy the Confederacy, but still maintain the status quo in terms of industry and foreign trade. The South had to resist invasion and stay intact, but had to establish a diverse industry as well as foreign recognition of sovereignty. Almost an inverse relationship of war aims for the North and South. In the North, the most important military leader was President Lincoln, who had the final say in all things military. Lincoln actually had a little experience in the military as he served in the Illinois militia during the Black Hawk War. His leadership of the military was mostly marked by frustration as his first general, Winfield Scott, the hero of the Mexican War, was too old to lead. The next general he appointed, the young George McClellan, who was too arrogant and hesitant. McClellan resented Lincoln's western roots and would run against him in the election of 1864. Lincoln would not find a capable leader until he found Ulysses S. Grant, a former officer in the Mexican War who actually had issues with alcoholism until he rejoined the military as part of the war effort for the Union. Grant understood that the Civil War would be won through relentless pursuit of the Southern armies and would preside over some of the Union's greatest victories, but also some of the Union's most violent episodes of the war. In the South, conflicts and leadership occurred frequently as Jefferson Davis saw himself as the unquestionable leader of the war effort. He would name General Robert E. Lee as his advisor until Lee left that position to command in the field. Davis would try and reshape the Southern military command structure, but that structure would fail to take shape, just as the last structure failed to win the war for the South. What was remarkable yet unsurprising about the Civil War is that many of the leaders literally went to the same schools of warfare, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point or the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. Many of the Southern and Northern generals knew each other and were sometimes even friendly with one another. However, many were hamstrung from using the outdated tactics of 18th century warfare taught at the academies. Successful campaigns were led by generals like William Tecumseh Sherman, who understood the workings of modern warfare at the time, which required not only waging war on an opposing army, but waging war on the society that supplied and populated the opposing army. As for the naval battles, the North had a massive advantage as the North already had a well-established navy. In order to weaken the South, the Union tried to blockade the southern ports so they couldn't get any supplies in from foreign powers. They were largely successful, but not entirely successful, as the South was able to utilize smaller ships to slip between the blockade. Not until the North was able to take over all southern ports were they able to stop all goods from coming into the South. Another big advantage the North had was to use ships to navigate rivers and supply troops and engage in attacks on the South, which worked because the South didn't really have ships to fight back against river attacks. Where the South did have some naval success was the utilization of ironclads. Ironclads were basically wooden ships that were reinforced with iron, which made them virtually impossible to sink at the time. The most successful successful Southern Ironside, the Virginia, was actually a former Union wooden ship that was called the Merrimack. The South would refit the ship with iron and would deal significant damage to the Union blockade off the coast of Norfolk, Virginia. However, this success was short-lived when the Union released its own ironclad, the Monitor, which fought the Virginia in March of 1862. Neither ship sank the other, but the Virginia's days of wreaking havoc on the U.S. blockade was over. As for foreign diplomacy, the Union hoped to maintain its ties with Europe, whereas the South was hoping to gain recognition for the cause and hopefully gain foreign aid and support. At first, both England and France declared themselves neutral, which really pissed off the North. It was basically kind of like getting into a fight and thinking your pals have your back, but they don't. Thanks a lot, jerks. What do you think of that, Taft? What do you think of France and England sort of turning their back on the North? Isn't that messed up? 
To be fair, England and France were a little worried about the growing power of the U.S., plus they kind of wanted to see how this would play out before they made any significant moves. The South hoped that their supply of cotton would entice France and England to their side, only to find that both countries had a good deal of cotton already that they could get from Egypt, India, and other colonies. Also, there was a great deal of popular support in Europe for the Union cause as it was seen as a cause against slavery. Leaders in Europe worried about committing to the South because of this, and even though many aristocrats sympathized with the South for its aristocratic vibes, siding with the South just didn't seem like a good idea at the time. The Trent Affair would be a particularly sticky issue for the North when two Southern diplomats snuck off to Cuba to board a ship called the Trent in order to try and broker an alliance in Europe. They were discovered by American authorities, were arrested, and brought to Boston. The English were upset by this as it was a violation of maritime law and demanded repayment and an apology, which the Lincoln administration provided a while later after things cooled down a bit. The West, though severely less populated, also experienced hostilities in the war. The most intense fighting occurred in Missouri and, of course, Kansas, which makes sense because that's where the most intense fighting occurred before the war. Southern aligned guerrilla fighters led by William C. Quantrill of Ohio would go out and basically fight anyone who was anti-slavery or perceived as anti-slavery. They'd essentially kill anyone they encountered, including 150 civilians in Lawrence, Kansas. Shortly after the war, the Union Army would arrest Quantrill and execute him. In response to the slaughter conducted by Quantrill's group, small groups of guerrilla fighters called Jayhawkers would form as they would engage in violence on pro-slavery supporters. And, of course, that's where the University of Kansas gets its mascot from. Go Jayhawks! Despite not having a single battle, Kansas and Missouri was one of the most terrifyingly violent places to be during the Civil War. The South also tried to gain an alliance with Native American tribes, and some were sympathetic to this idea as they hated the U.S. government and with good reason. Native tribes would support both the Union and the Confederacy and would even have a small civil war in their own right. Above all else, one thing to know about the war was that it was incredibly violent and fatal. Over 680 18,000 Americans died in the war, which is somewhat of an odd thing to say, because can we really call Southerners who seceded Americans? I mean, when you secede from a country, you can't really be called someone from that country anymore. That's kind of what rebelling is. What do you think, Taft? Well, you might be on to something, bro. Nice butt, by the way. Regardless, more Americans died in the Civil War than any war before or since. More than the 115,000 who died in World War I, more than the 318,000 who died in World War II. Despite all this violence, the Civil War is by far the most studied and most romanticized war in history. A large degree of that notoriety comes from the often brave and dynamic individuals who fought, led, and often died in the war. The Civil War was one of the first major conflicts to occur after the Industrial Revolution. And just as the Industrial Revolution would dramatically alter society, it would also dramatically alter how societies fought one another. One of the most powerful innovations of the war would be the repeating weapons. With the Winchester rifle and early Gatling guns, rounds could be fired quickly, before guns took forever to reload. So you had lines of soldiers firing in lines, taking turns with repeating guns, this style of fighting would mean slaughter as the new guns would literally mow down lines of soldiers. It took incredibly large amounts of bloodshed to realize this, but eventually both sides figured out that you had to stay low to the ground and duck for cover, or perhaps dig a trench for safety. There were also vast improvements in cannons and long-range artillery weapons thanks to improvements in steel. In a lot of ways, the Civil War was a preview of the carnage to come in World War I. The use of the railroad and telegraph would be important as well in terms of supplying and moving armies, as well as relaying intelligence. The North had significant advantage in both of these regards. But both trains and telegraphs were pretty limited because they couldn't really get to a whole lot of places, and both could be somewhat easily destroyed or sabotaged. With such huge armies and huge efforts to supply and maintain those armies, the Civil War became one of the first 
total wars. A total war is a war where the line between enemy and civilian becomes much more blurry. Before, you only fought soldiers, but with the Civil War, you had to fight the society that maintained and upheld the enemy's soldiers. William Tecumseh Sherman understood this all too well, which is why the South still kind of hates him to this day, even though he's dead. Which brings us to the course of battle. Now, I'm not going to lie. I'm not a huge battle buff guy when it comes to the Civil War or any war, really. Frankly, I find it somewhat inappropriate and perverse when people romanticize battles in which scores of people die in ghastly, painful, and violent ways. I'm from the belief that all the people that died in the Civil War and everywhere were all human beings with mothers and fathers and some with sons and daughters who were convinced to kill other strangers who also had mothers and fathers and maybe sons and daughters too. I think the causes and effects of the war are far more important to understand, but nonetheless, for the sake of understanding how the war played out, we'll go over the general narrative of the Civil War as well as some of the battles as well as their significance. So here we go. The first battle of the Civil War was the Battle of Bull Run or the Battle of Manassas, depending where you're from. This was a battle the Union hoped they would win and win decisively and perhaps end the war quickly. They would not. The South, under the command of P.T. Beauregard, was able to counterattack after initial Union success and push back the Union Army under the command of Irvin McDowell. However, the South didn't have the organization or supplies to pursue the North, but they didn't really have to. The importance of this battle was that the North would realize that this war would not be quick. It's also a weird battle, as people actually went to watch it like some sort of weird, violent sporting event. It would actually be the last time and people thought that that sort of thing was a good idea. Meanwhile, in Missouri, a battle at Wilson's Creek saw Union forces lose yet again, but in the process, critically damaged rebel forces. The South would afterwards be unable to take Missouri. In the early years of the war, the East proved to be a bloody stalemate, meaning nobody could really gain much headway on either side. The West was where the Union found its first success. The first major success came in the capture of New Orleans. The Union actually sailed around through the Gulf of Mexico and attacked from the South with the aid from from ironclads. The rebels were completely caught by surprise as they were expecting to get attacked from the north. With little resistance, the Union was able to take the mouth of the Mississippi River as well as the banking center of the South New Orleans in April of 1862. The hope of the Union was to take all of the Mississippi River, split the South in two, and have complete access to a major waterway. Ulysses S. Grant led the armies in the North and found success until he got to Shiloh, where he eventually had success, but it took a lot longer and costed far more lives. Grant's Union Army was met by a large Southern Army led by Albert Sidney Johnston and PGT frickin' Beauregard again. Old General Beauregard was quite the thorn in the Union side. A hey, Taft. There was some back and forth, but Grant's army eventually won and forced the rebels to retreat. The Union made considerable progress in the West. The East was a different story. In 1862, the armies of the North and the East were led by the man with perhaps the second most punchable face in the 19th century, George B. McClellan. A man whose posture just screams, throw mud and garbage at me. Please, just do it. I deserve to be disgraced. McClellan was known to be great on the training ground, but was far too hesitant on the battlefield. McClellan was able to maneuver around through the Chesapeake Bay where he planned to take the capital of the Confederacy, Richmond, Virginia, after linking up with some other Union armies. McClellan made his way west and won at the Battle of Seven Pines, but daring maneuvers by a young commander named Thomas Stonewall Jackson thwarted McClellan's ability to link up with his army. McClellan also delayed his advance, which gave the South enough time to launch their own attacks under the command of Robert E. Lee, and the whole thing was wrecked. We see further dithering in the Battle of Antietam. McClellan actually managed to get his hands on a copy of General Lee's battle plans, which involved linking up with Jackson's army. One would think with access to these battle plans that he would win and win decisively, right? Wrong. 
Rather than attack fast and prevent this linking of armies, McClellan did what he did best, which was delay and cause more people to die and make the war unnecessarily close. 85,000 Union troops under McClellan would fight against 50,000 troops under Lee. Roughly 6,000 men died in that single battle. McClellan narrowly drove Lee's army away, but of course did not pursue, nor did he gain much of anything in the process. By then, Lincoln had had enough, and McClellan was removed from command. He would be briefly replaced by General Ambrose Burnside, who was noteworthy for his sick sideburns, which are called that because of him. However, he's definitely not known for military victory because he didn't really do that either. People in the North were perplexed. They would ask themselves, why aren't we winning? We have more troops, more guns, more supplies, more everything. We should be winning. Many blamed incompetent generals like George Stupid Face McTakes Forever McClellan, and they had a point, because he did take forever. But people began to realize that this war was different from other wars, and that winning battles would not really win the war. One had to break the other side's spirit to fight in order to win. This was a total war. This was a war of attrition, which the Union was built to withstand, but the South not so much. In 1863, the war took a decisive turn for the North. First, in the Battle of Chancellorsville, under the command of General Joseph Hooker, no laughing, Taft. This is the Civil War. Very serious business, no laughter allowed. Anyways, General Fighting Joe Hooker went to lead an army to take Chancellorsville, and to fit the theme of the Northern Army, he delayed, split his army up, got outmaneuvered by General Lee, and lost. Oops. However, in the West, the North continued to have success as Ulysses S. Grant took Vicksburg, thanks to some deft maneuvering of his own, as well as a brutal six-week siege which almost starved the town to death. The Union achieved one of its objectives on splitting the South in two at the Mississippi River. While the battle at Vicksburg was happening, General Lee made a somewhat desperate attempt to turn the tide of war by attacking the North in their own territory at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He I figured this would divert attention away from Vicksburg, demoralize the North, and convince France and England to give the South much-needed aid. However, it failed. After four days of brutal fighting, Lee withdrew from Gettysburg on the 4th of July, and the South no longer posed a serious threat to taking land in the North. Interestingly enough, the South's efforts were effectively doomed as both Gettysburg and Vicksburg were both lost in symbolic fashion on the 4th of July. A third decisive battle occurred at the Battle of Chattanooga, which occurred later that fall. This was an exciting battle as it looked like the South might win, but then Ulysses S. Grant showed up with reinforcements and the North actually won. Whoa! The importance of these victories is that the Southern nation was cut off from four of their 11 states. They now had almost no chance to win the war through military victory. Their only chance was to just outlast the Northern efforts in order to get them to surrender and hopefully the North would give up. They would not. As the South's efforts were in their death throes, Lincoln appointed the most capable general he had to lead the Union Army to finish the job in Ulysses S. Grant. Grant's success largely came from the fact that he correctly recognized that the North, with its much larger army and more abundant resources, could simply overwhelm the South. He didn't try to be too cute with his tactics like fancy boy George McClellan. He just attacked. Unfortunately, this often meant that Grant suffered heavy losses, and that's tough to deal with no matter who you are. But he would be the man to finish the job and would win a presidential election later on because of it. To win the war, Grant sought to take the last two major cities of the South, Atlanta and Richmond. Taking Richmond proved to be incredibly difficult. Grant would advance to take Lee's army, but would often be repelled. Lee remained able to stay between Grant and the capital, so to get around this, Grant would move his troops east of Richmond to try to take it from that angle. While all this was happening, the other half of the Union Army marched to Atlanta where they were able to capture the city under the command of William Tecumseh Sherman. Union troops would set the town on fire in hopes of destroying any and all possibility of replenishing the southern army. He then would lead his troops in their famous march to the sea in which he encouraged his troops to inflict as much damage as possible. On this march, property would be destroyed, food and goods stolen, men, women, and children killed, and there were even instances of rape 
rape and other atrocities, but also scores of enslaved Africans were freed and would join the march as well. Sherman would justify the march by saying, war is all hell, which meant that though war should be avoided, it should be hellish for one's opponent when it occurs. Sherman then marched upward to meet Grant's army and is still vilified in the South and by many military historians to this day, and somewhat rightfully so. Grant was finally able to corner Lee's army and allow no escape. Realizing that further resistance would only cause unnecessary bloodshed, Lee surrendered his armies in a house at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. Other Confederate armies would surrender shortly thereafter. Though the war was won, massive new questions would arise. Would the North continue its dominance over the country as the South had feared? Things sure looked that way as the North gained a great deal of strength because of the war. Could the North and South ever be reconciled or were their differences too great for the two regions of the country to ever get along? But the most important result of the war is unquestionably both the triumph and uncertainty of African Americans who were now free. Yes, the three and a half million folks who were living in bondage were now free, but what would they have apart from their freedom? How would they function in a society that previously saw them as slaves? How would they live in a country where the majority of the citizens living there doubted their ability to contribute to the progress of that nation? Would the Civil War live up to the legacy of building a better nation for all its citizens, regardless of race? Or would the work remain undone for generations born after the firing of those first shots in 1861? I'm excited to see what you all think, and we'll continue to examine the history behind it all next week. On behalf of Taft and myself, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and until next week, we got to keep pushing, G. Thank you.